welcome to the Lubber's Hole, a Patrick O'Brien podcast. You're with Ian. And with Mike. And the two of us are rereading our favourite series of novels, the Aubrey Maturin novels of Patrick O'Brien. Mike, we're getting deeper and deeper into this book. Would you remind us how, how deep we had got last week? What further depths might we be plumbing this week? Oh, I've been delighted to. Thanks, Ian. Last week in Chapter 4, Jack had been arrested for debt. A badly injured Stephen, still recovering from the torture, had sung Jack's praises, which motivated Sir Joseph to reach out and help Jack, who we talked about he'd never met. Sir Joseph used his retirement privileges to appoint Stephen and Jack to HMS Surprise on a mission to take a top envoy from Britain to Kampong. Sophie and Jack promised to wait for each other forever and ever and ever as we close that chapter. Chapter five this week, a new ship, officers and crew all together in a metaphorical crucible. Mm -hmm. Interesting characters, new and old, and a very different kind of action. We examine sea officers, authority and humanity, men and marriage, various rats, light and colors, and swimming the Hellespont. Wow. <laughs> well, all, all this might, in, in a chapter where, compared to recent times, not so much happens, but we'll, we'll get into that. Oh, it's great. I, I, I'll, I'll own up right now. I had a big smile on my face as I was rereading this chapter for this episode, and the, I started saying to myself, this is one of my favorites. This is one of my favorite chapters. And I sure probably say that about half of the chapters that I read, but I absolutely love this to bits. So here we go. The chapter opens with Patrick O'Brien describing to us in glorious poetic writing, the noonday sun beating down on Bombay at the same moment that the same sun rises above the horizon, far over to the west of Africa, sending, in O'Brien's words, a fiery dart to strike the limp royals and top gallants of the surprise. Limp because, of course, the ship is becalmed just north of the equator, 30 degrees west of Greenwich, and it's beautiful. And we go from this really breathtaking change of scene, this really breathtaking cinematic view right up close to Stephen, who's getting woken up by the captain of the afterguard. Stephen, in the heat, has been sleeping on deck and the captain of the afterguard has got the grim task of shaking Stephen into wakefulness. Before we get into that, I, I just want to say I love the poetry. I, I love that it's a Patrick O'Brien regular, right? When he wants to be metaphysical and poetical, he gives us light and sky. And he did that in the action in Mahon, and he's starting out with it here. And I absolutely love it. We're going to pay a lot of attention in this chapter to heat and warmth and already here fiery darts and all the luscious colors of the sunrise it's there and it's a really really breathtaking change of perspective it carries with it of course the promise that we're headed to india i mean we, we've talked about india but this is the first moment where at, at least in our virtual god's eye we're over bombay in the kind of oppressive stifling heat and mike th this is a, a new kind of exoticism for patrick o'brien we've been in uh, the Mediterranean, we've been in the English Channel, we've been basically in France and Spanish territories and England, but now oh, we're headed east. And I think it's a really, really great moment. I'm sure it's no accident. You know, in, in the 60s and 70s, there was this trend of exoticism in popular literature. All the works of James Clavell, Paul Scott, the guy who wrote Jewel in the Crown, Olivia Manning, Lawrence Durrell, even Frank Herbert's Dune, you could say, was a work of kind of exoticism and I'm sure O'Brien did it deliberately to say, hey, you worldly wise people who love color and spice and exoticism, I've got some of that for you. It's not all just about sausages and rats. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, Ian, you're, you're so right. It, in so many ways, this starts to blend so much of the first two books, but in a whole new setting. And, right. you know, really, we were talking about this the other day. I think so many times we say, just like this is our favorite chapter, we also say, boy, his writing chops, you know, just so good now. I mean, this might be top of his game, but you know, we keep yeah, saying yeah. top of his game, top of his game. But you're right. Well, we're, we're joining this. We've had that light. Like you said, we've had this color. 
And we learned that the envoy and his suite have the great cabin. So this yeah. is, we remember, surprise is a small vessel and the great cabin now occupied. And they're in this eastern heat and the frigate is just stifling between decks. So Stephen, rather than be cooped up in this stifling heat, had hoped to sleep on deck. But each changing watch that had come about successively had walked on him and he'd finally gotten back to sleep and he's awoken from a state of total relaxation and O'Brien adds an erotic dream. You know, nobody, nobody likes to be awoken from a total relaxation, much less an erotic dream. Stephen snarls at the captain of the afterguard who woke him up. And the captain asks Stephen, well, you know, what, what would the quarterdeck look like covered in tar spots with us rigging church this morning? Stephen realizes now he's waking up a little bit, takes the bag off his head that was trying to keep him peaceful, that they've sanded and holy stoned all around him. And he walks off saying, no peace in this infernal hulk or tub, persecution, Judaic superstition, ritual cleanliness, archaic fools. And Stephen stands, he walks over to the railing and the sun shoots what O'Brien writes as a grateful living warmth right into his bones. A cock crows and a hen joyfully announces that she's laid an egg, an egg. So Ian, this description power that you're talking about, it just goes on and on. It's absolutely lovely. Every Everything that O'Brien turns his kind of lens to in the first few pages of this chapter, he just describes to perfection with his little half smile on his face all the way through. Now, there's a, there's a moment of physical comedy here because, of course, as Stephen stumbles away from where all the tar spots are, we discover that, well, he notices, first of all, that there are disapproving faces looking after him. And he realizes that on his shoes is this tar and pitch and resin that he's now stepping prints of across the deck. And he goes into overcompensate mode. He has, bring me a scraper, bring me some sand. They're all trying to get him to stop because they know how it's done. But he says, no, no, I'm going to take care of this. He calls for what he calls aqua regia, royal water, which I think is a mixture of nitric acid and sulfuric acid. And Ooh. that's not going to work. <laughs> it, it might make the mess disappear before your eyes, but not mm. in the way that you're thinking of. And it's just funny. And who eventually puts him out of his misery but Jack Aubrey. But remember as well, we've been talking about light and sun and heat. And what does Captain Aubrey cast? He casts a shadow. So we've got this kind of continual lighting motive going on in these first few paragraphs here. This shadow falling across the deck is naked Jack Aubrey with a towel. And he sees what's happening. It says, don't worry, we're going to fix this Navy fashion. What do you say to a swim? By the way, I, I love the fact that Stephen snuck in a cheeky reference to Macbeth. He said, there is this damn spot and I'm going to get it out, which is a, a bit of a Macbeth quote. Anyhow, Jack says, well, let me make this easy for you. Why don't you take off your shoes? And uh, Stephen does this. And we get yet another little nugget here. Stephen, looking at the soles of his shoes, remarks, Martial tells us that in his day, the ladies of the town had sequime engraved upon their sandals, from which it's reasonable to conclude that Rome was uncommon muddy for sand, would scarcely hold the print. Which is a great bit of diversion. I think he's probably diverting himself as right. much as diverting everybody else away from this. But I mean, now, Mike, I've heard this thing before about prostitutes in the cities of ancient Rome having follow me or other things carved into their feet as a sort of imprint. Is this real? Is this something that Martial wrote about, as Stephen says here? Well, you're, you're exactly right. Ian. It's it's if if it's in Martial, we can't find it. You know, Karen Ruff, our consulting medieval Latinist, did you know? I I did a first search. She went super deep, and not only does she say she doesn't find it there, but she really couldn't find any other Latin texts that have this kind of reference that Stephen's talking about. Um, but she did point us to a site where the Christian writer Clement of Alexandria in 150 CE wrote about prostitutes carving you know, or having carved these erotic scenes on the bottom of their sandals. Fascinating scholarly article about kind of the working relationship between 
shoemakers and and prostitutes in this time. Right. You know, remembering that prostitutes back then were male and female, young and old. Yeah. But it, we, we we digress. And in fact, we see this through history that even in the Civil War, camp followers would use little like metal heart shaped things on the muddy trails to guide the soldiers to you know where they might find a little bit of R and R. But there is, in fact, a, a remnant, a physical remnant. There's a picture from the Louvre. There's a, a also kind of a, a ceramic replica of one of these sandals from back in that time, actually with Greek on it, the Greek akulutheiai uh, for follow me written on the bottom. But some people who have referenced that have said, ah, it looks like they took the Latinized version. So maybe this was in any event. Yes, it's there. But the, the thing that really got me wasn't just this reference, which was fascinating, this whole yeah. idea. But how in the world does Stephen go from spreading tar <laughs> across the deck to this reference? And it's one of the first one of several scenes in this thing where I'm thinking, well, what's what's O'Brien put this here for? What what does this mean? What what are we telling us here? I'm I'm thinking, okay, follow me. Is this just another one of these fun O'Brien jokes? Ah ha ha, look at this. This is really about prostitutes. Or does it serve some purpose? And I couldn't help but think about, you know, recently in the last couple of chapters, we had Jack constantly wondering who on the lively is going to follow me. Oh, look, Ooh, nobody's yeah. going to follow me. Oh, look who's following. And I thought, so this has come up a lot. And I thought, is this pointing us towards anything? I don't know. But clearly we've got a bunch of a new ship, new men. And a lot of this chapter is kind of about who's making up this ship and, and their okay. skills and, and camaraderie and stuff. So who knows? Maybe this was a follow me flag from O'Brien. Wow. <laughs> I think, by the way, it points to a, a, a tentative diagnosis of ADHD in the character of Stephen Maturin as well. But <laughs> <laughs> which, which, is, which is really unhandy because when, when you have it on my end too, then the two of us just spin off into endless circles. <laughs> well, exactly. And then you end up making a podcast about it. Amazing. Amazing. Right. Oh. Anyhow, they, they go in for a swim, which again is beautifully, beautifully visually described. And we see it from Jack's point of view. He looks up and he sees the skirt of weeds below the hull of the surprise, sees these little fishes. S Stephen gets to dive in as well. And we don't have time to go into the language here, but it's just beautiful. The ship and the sunlight and oh, it's just beautiful. Now, you can also argue about whether whether light has anything to do with the contrast with all the near-death experiences that we've had in recent chapters as well. But again, per perhaps not much time to go into that. Stephen, in contrast to all this beauty and kind of grace in nature, is very, very ungraceful as he jumps in and starts swimming in this brilliant description by Patrick O'Brien. Short, cataleptic jerks with his eyes tightly shut and his mouth clenched in savage determination. And this is funny, but it's also uh, only a few steps short of a miracle, I think, because right. Stephen was pretty much crippled as they came away from the uh, the torture scene in Mahon there. And he's been swimming over the side little by little, more and more every day for, what, 2,000 miles or so. And since he's been able to make use of the, the, the dead calm of the last 300 or so miles, he's been able to make really, really great progress. Our attention is drawn to it, and Stephen's really proud of it as well on the other hand the thought running in jack's head right now is we're short of water and uh, how long is our allowance going to last yeah yeah Stephen, with these cataleptic you know swimming jerks jack in the water but thinking about yeah, yeah. all this dead calm Stephen's making great progress and we got to get out of here <laughs> yeah well, Jack swims towards Stephen, who's holding on to one of the boats trailing the surprise. You know, it's so hot out there that they're worried that the seams are going to split on these boats. So they've got them all in the water behind them to kind of keep them sealed. Stephen says to Jack that he swam the entire length of the ship today, 420 strokes without a pause. And Jack tells him, well done indeed. While at the same time, Jack's thinking that, wait a minute. Given the length of the surprise, that means Stephen was going about three inches per stroke. 
you know, you know, the surprise, just a little 28 gun, sixth rate of 579 tons, what some people, you know, people usually not on them call a jackass frigate. You know, Jack is telling in his mind, Jack offers Stephen a hand up, but Stephen doesn't want it. And we get a little bit of a view into the situation from the brilliant all seeing Mr. O'Brien, who tells us that, you know, Stephen hates being helped, even initially when his limbs were so twisted that he couldn't carry himself across the deck. He still didn't want to be helped. And despite all this, you know, the miracle you alluded to earlier, Ian, that Stephen had walked the deck even then many times every day. At Lisbon, he started crawling into the mizzen top daily, allowing only Bondin to attend to him. Jack watched this in agony, and, and he asked two men to always run below with fenders in case Stephen should slip and fall down. Every evening, all through this journey, Stephen forced his mutilated hand to skip up and down the muted strings of his cello as his face continually turned a paler and paler gray. You know, we assume you know, from the pain of doing this, but he's made this incredible progress. Stephen asks Jack how wide the Hellespont is. And Jack says, the Hellespont, well, you know, it's a mile or so. It's point blank range on both sides. And Stephen says, well, the next time we're there, I intend to swim it. Cool. And Jack replies, I'm sure you will. If one hero could, I'm sure another can. All right. In. All right, another another classical reference here, right? Uh, and a play on the play on the word hero as well. Yes, if you've been with us right from the very beginning, you might remember that we've come across this elsewhere. Mike, I think it was in or will be in Clarissa Oaks, and I hope that's exactly. not exactly. It's Clarissa yeah. Oaks. Yes. So uh, this idea of swimming the Hellespont. The Hellespont is the stretch of water between uh, what you might call European Turkey and Asian Turkey. Uh, at, at Istanbul where. Um, this actually refers to the, the Greek myth of the two characters, Hero and Leander. Hero is a priestess of Aphrodite, lives on the European side, and Leander, who is a young man living on the opposite side, the Asian side, in a town called Abydos. And guess what? It's mythology. So these two people in opposite sides of the, the world pretty much fall in love. And Leander would swim across the Hellespont nightly to go see his lover, Hero, guided by the torch at the top of her tower. And they had agreed to part for the winter due to the rough seas. But on this one particular stormy night, Leander sees the torch, thinks that his lover is calling for him, starts to swim across. The light is blown out. Leander loses his way and drowns. And in the way of tragic mythology of all time, when Hero sees his dead body, she herself throws herself off the tower to be with him in death. So as, as well as the play on the words of Hero, how like Patrick O'Brien to take us from a reference to friendship and heroism into uh, doomed love and death, which is never far from the back of our minds, right, Mike? Right. Good stuff. Anyway, back on deck... Jack Aubrey is standing there in a flowered silk dressing gown, no less. And he's foregoing the tempting smells of coffee and bacon in order to watch the crew as they stow their hammocks. And remember that as the crew will turn up from below, they have to wrap their hammocks up into a bundle. And he's not impressed with the standard of this uh, hammock wrapping. And he's glad that Tom Pullings, who's officer of the watch, is telling them all about it in this very unsunday tone of voice. And I like this little moment here. Jack, growing a little bit of low-key irritation in his heart here, decides, oh, screw it. I'm not, I'm not going to have anybody for breakfast today. You know, the day is starting out only five out of ten on the scale, so I'm just going to breakfast by myself. Hold that thought. Because what next happens is one of the envoys suite a civilian by the name of Mr. Atkins, a man who has strange notions of his own importance, sometimes very high and kind of arrogant and offended, sometimes over-familiar, staggers towards Jack across the quarterdeck. And my, if flabby hammocks <laughs> were creating low-key irritation for Jack, what kind of irritation are we going to get from Mr. Atkins here? You're, you're absolutely right, because Atkins 
Atkins has no idea the sacrosanctity of a captain. And he joins Jack in his pacing. So he comes across and he's pacing right next to Jack here. And he tells him there's good news. His excellency is far better today. And he hints that an invitation to dinner today, you know, no great preparations needed, might prove acceptable. And Jack very matter-of-factly says, not today, today's Sunday. I dine with the gun room on Sunday. And Atkins says, well, no prior invitation could stand in the way of his majesty's direct representative. And Jack replies, naval custom is holy at sea, Mr. Atkins, and turns away. You know, and as you say, Ian, this this changes Jack's mood, right? Yeah, right. Uh, and then he thinks to himself, ah, screw this guy. <laughs> uh, he goes, Pullings, Callow, my cabin for breakfast. Come on, we're going to eat together. I love that little turnaround. Um, I think that Atkins is what is known correctly in the uh, psychological profession as a uh, as a jumped up pain in the ass. But <laughs> we'll, we'll go deeper into that diagnosis and all of his symptoms. I think later on in the book. So the Cabin is, after all, crowded with guests at breakfast because, as well as Jack, there's Stephen and now, of course, Pullings and Callow, the volunteer midshipman. They're sitting in the coach, not in the great cabin, because the great cabin has got the uh, the envoy and his party. Callow, God bless him, eats his way through 27 rashes of bacon. And as he's in between mouthfuls of bacon here, says, well, the midshipmen are down to Miller's at Threepence. Now, Mike, I, you and I had a conversation about rashes. I didn't know that this is a British thing, but a rasher is a slice of bacon, okay? And a dozen and a half rashers is probably about half a pound. So Callow is putting away about a pound of bacon here, which on first glance seems like a lot, but then A, the kid's a teenager, and B, as we're going to hear shortly, the, the ship's got plenty of pork. So he's stuffing his face with rashers, but he says, what about Miller's? And that gets us into this conversation about rats. Stephen has to ask the question, what are these millers? Jack gives him the explanation. They call them, he says, they call them millers to make them eat better and maybe because they're getting dusty from being into the flour and the peas. And Stephen says, well, that's not how it is for my rats. And he goes on to explain that his rats eat only the best biscuit moistened with butter. And I can just imagine their chins falling on the table as they turn to the doctor who's explaining this thing he's doing with his rats. How come you have rats? Stephen says, I'm going to observe them. Um, he doesn't, however, maybe with his naturally secretive nature, he doesn't tell them that he's doing this experiment, feeding them madder, which is the red dye that he had already bought ashore. And he wants to see how long it takes to penetrate their bones. Let's just say there's a little plant going on here. And we, we kind of wave off the whole topic of rats for now as Jack recollects that as a midshipman aboard the surprise he remembers that there was a good spot where he and Henage dundas used to catch rats and this prompts a fresh round of amazement around the table this time amazement on the part of young callow right right you know this youngster callow who's you know it's stuffed full of bacon here is amazed amazed that the captain was a midshipman in the surprise good heaven sir she must be very, very old. The oldest ship in the fleet, I dare say. Jack says, well, she, she is old, and she was taken early in the last war, the French Unité. And she was no chicken then, says Jack. So she was old when we got her here. Now, interestingly, I thought, wait wait a minute. I'm trying to remember. How, how old is this? Because I'm over the course of the canon, you'll hear references to the surprise throughout. A little bit of a spoiler. Her canon history, if you will, the history of this ship, and Jack's recollections about his history on her don't quite square with the historical record. Uh, for those people who are really kind of into, you know, did O'Brien do this exactly, exactly on everything? Anthony Gary Brown's uh, Patrick O'Brien Muster book believes that this is because there were actually two historical ships whose histories are sometimes confused. And, and you see various you know, kind of references from back in the day, confusing these from time to time. Jack's surprise may be kind of a, a combination of these two ships, partially, you know, perhaps on purpose, partly because if you look at references from back in the day, sometimes they are confusing. Part of this is, is very understandable. There was, number one, a 24-gun corvette, Unité, launched at Le Havre, 
1794, captured in 1796, and renamed Surprise. Now, that's clearly the primary model. Most of what we hear you know, sits with that. But there was also a 36-gun frigate launched at Gracios and renamed Unité in 1793, and then that name was changed to Variant in 1796. So we've got lots of, of wow. you know, crisscrossing. It's then taken by the Royal Navy in 1796 and renamed HMS Unify or Unite. You know, both spellings are used in the historical record. And both of these ships happened to be sold out of the service in 1802. So again, oh. ah, you know, confusion, confusion, overlap, overlap, overlap. Um, but it, you pointed out that not only as Callow perhaps need to work on his social skills, <laughs> you know, sir, if you were there, you must be the old, but that in fact, he's wrong historically, you know, surprise can right. very well be the oldest ship, right? True. I mean, there was a whole new generation of frigates and ships of the line being built in the time of the revolutionary wars, but there were plenty of ships, even older HMS victory was launched in 1765, having been laid down even a few years before that. So wow. old ships were not so uncommon in that era. Anyhow, we always get a bit of a smile when Jack's in company with midshipmen here. The tone is always kind of lighthearted and there's some learning. And this is no different. Jack next sits down with the midshipmen to look over their logs. And he summons the boatswain, the gunner, the carpenter, and the purser to go over their accounts and their reports. He's still got this thought in the back of his mind from the swim that he's worried about provisions. All the butter and cheese is rancid. The water has leaked away. The newfangled iron tank has, in the words of the text, silently leaked its heart out. And th this is a bad scenario. Pl plenty of pork, plenty of bacon for midshipmen, but they're really, really short of water. But... Jack has to set this aside because it's time for lunch. Time for dinner, I should say, in the language of the time. So Killick signals to Jack that it's time to change into his best uniform. That's at 10.30. Before lunch, we're going to have a muster and an inspection. So off we go. Jack's still thinking about water. He's thinking about navigation, all the westward drift that they've made from where you'd expect to be tied in with the coast of Africa. They're actually all the way over near to uh, Cape San Roque in Brazil. Slightly good news is that the wind picks up a little and the boat manages to set a little bit of sail and we manage to start to make some progress just as the ship starts to clear for muster and inspection. Now, this gives us the chance to take a fresh look at the officers and in particular, Lieutenant Hervey. This plump, myopic, as he is described, First Lieutenant Hervey seems to have more confidence than usual as he reports that there's steerage way now and the, the ship is underway. It's a good job that he's not touchy because nobody on the boat, least of all Jack, has any kind of opinion of his seamanship. But we know that as long as Hervey is treated with kindness, he never takes offence at criticism. And Jack points him in the way of easing things in the rig a little bit and getting the boat sailing more freely. They might cross the line, cross the equator before nightfall, suggests Jack. And that's in their minds as they beat to divisions. We get this little ceremony of the order of beating to divisions passed along. Hervey tells Nichols, who's the officer of the, officer of the watch, who tells Babington, uh, the mate of the watch, who opens his mouth to tell the marine drummer as the drum starts to thunder. The drum's completely unnecessary. No one's surprised or taken back by it because this is mostly a ship's company of experienced men and they've known what was coming. So even so, we've got the midshipmen kind of fussing around, getting people to toe the line, straightening up their dress. But as O'Brien writes, the muster was understood by all hands to be a formal ceremony, as formal as a dance, a slow, solemn dance, with a captain opening the ball. And oh, Mike, the, we get a little introduction to one of the themes of the chapter here, which is the idea of chain of command, right? And that's exactly what Jack's going to, uh, to exhibit in the inspection that follows. Yeah, absolutely right, Ian. And, and, you know, this thing has just gone all the way down and now it comes all the way back up. All the officers report in. They all go all the way up to Harvey. Harvey tells Jack. Jack, boom, starts the inspection, starting with the Marines who are standing without the benefit of the awning. You know, so they're way out there in the heat. They're in their scarlet perfection with their muskets and faces blazing straight on in the sun. And, and Jack, 
O'Brien tells us really doesn't know the exact standards for the Marines, you know, how much weak powder they should have, what degree of button brilliance is really set by the Marines as their gold center. But Lieutenant Etheridge there is very competent. And the text says that it would be impossible you know, for Jack to fault him. But, says the text, Jack's role in all this was to be the eye of God. And he carried out his inspection with impersonal gravity. So, you know, Jack's not saying, gee, I'm not exactly sure how to judge this. He's the eye of God. As a man, it says, he felt for the Marines broiling there. As a captain, he left them to their motionless suffering. The tar was already dripping on the awnings as the sun gathered even greater strength. And with the words, very credible, Mr. Etheridge, again, this you know, chain and rolls up a command, Jack leaves. So very credible, walks on. And and with Jack, he is playing to a T his sacred role in this ceremony, setting aside his personal feelings. So again, it is you say we're going to come back to this in multiple different ways, kind of staring into these same situations. Oh, it's great. Jack now moves on to the Foxal men. And these are the best examples of seamanship in the ship. These are very mature men. They're led by Nichols, the second lieutenant. And everything seems to be in order with the Foxal men, except that as he finishes his inspection, Jack receives Nichols' parting salute and is shocked to see that he's ill-shaven. He, Nichols himself, and his, his, his linen, his clothing, are dirty. And Jack's never seen this kind of uncleanliness in an officer and nor had he often seen such a look of veiled indifference and weariness. Mm -hmm. So we start to have some doubts about Nichols and how he's doing and why he's sort of checked out of his naval role a little bit. Jack, even so, continues through the rest of the ship's company. He asks Pullings about one of his men who appears to have had some kind of injury. This is a man who'd fallen off the top gallant yard. And again, Jack noticed that the man has got a puffed face, sunken eyes, dull and lifeless and meanwhile there's another man in babington's division of wasters who has the same look and i think a suspicion is starting to grow in jack's mind here there's one particular guy who's wearing a bone ring around his neck scarf that has a likeness of the sophie and jack is thinking am i sailing with a shipmate's son and apart from a, a common theme that we're going to come back to over and over again which is jack aging we get this nice reflection on how Jack hopes that these men will serve their guns the way they ought to serve their God. He's really worried that these men are going to be able to follow in the hierarchy of the ship, that they will be obedient to, to command, that the chain of command will flow from Jack down through the officers and midshipmen to the men here. And it's interesting as well that Jack is very alert to changes. He's very alert to the contrast in age. He's very alert to the way time has moved on. And I, maybe, Mike, you and I were talking about this yesterday, that th this chapter's got a bit of a theme of people adapting or not to changes that have come along, uh, how we all react differently to change at different times. Even back in post-Captain, the, the duel that you might have thought was going to take place didn't take place. Jack and Stephen both kind of ad adapted in their reaction to the situation they were in and their friendship. And, you know, we're often telling ourselves a story in our minds about where we are and what's going to happen next. And let's see where that takes us this chapter. Yeah, it, it, it's so true. And, and, and I just love the way O'Brien just masterfully weaves all these things together in big ways and little ways. You know, the yeah. duel was a big way. Here, you know, we heard earlier Callas going, oh, my gosh, you know, this must be the oldest ship if you were a midshipman on her. Then, oh, look, uh, Gosh, you know, here's I'm sailing with a shipmate's son or something or nephew or something. Gosh, I must really be getting old. And then, you know, O'Brien very subtly says, you know, he moves on. He meets the bosun and the carpenter and the gunner on the forecastle, and his feeling of great age falls away. So all of a sudden, you know, like we said about Stephen and Jack kind of telling themselves a different story that circumvents the duel. Jack's been telling himself, somebody's calling me old. Oh, Gosh, here's this young man that, you know, perhaps I sailed with his uncle. Mm, I must be getting old. Ah, wait, here are all these old guys 
Yeah. I'm not so old. I'm pretty young. Look at this. <laughs> and it says, Jack feels painfully young under Rattrys, the bosun's keen, gray, respectful, but somewhat cynical eye. He felt that this eye pierced straight through his post captain's epaulette and did not think much of what it saw below, was not deceived by the pomp. Inwardly, Jack agreed, says the text, but outwardly, again, this personal and professional, right? Outwardly, Jack stiffens, he resumes his role, and he exchanges the typical formal courtesies. So this whole personal, professional, what are the stories we're telling ourselves? You know, you could get onto this thing about age, you could get into this thing about, you know, am I really kind of an imposter here? Look at Rattry, you know, my original bosun when I was a, you know, a, a youngster here looking at me now as a post captain, all of this stuff. So I love this. I love how O'Brien is doing this in what otherwise you could just read through and say, oh, okay, we're kind of introducing all the characters. Let's go through. There's nothing nothing to see here. Plenty to see here. Yeah. And of course, he goes on. And there's, there's another moment of mirth where he's, he's, he's points something out and the youngsters in this division all kind of giggle and can't control themselves. And he's thinking, oh, I'm kind of old next to these people as well. And I'm not really any longer part of the giggling midshipman's crew either, even though he remembers how he once was along with Henry Dundas. Anyhow, setting aside the passage of time and the change of roles, Jack's still got this niggling worry in his mind about the health of the crew. In the larboard wasters and in the afterguard, he sees more of these gloomy, lackluster faces. And this makes him think that it's a good thing that he's not undermanned. And he reflects on how his predecessor, Captain Simmons, had rather let discipline grow slack aboard the surprise before he, Simmons had passed away. Hervey, the first lieutenant, is not the man to build an efficient crew. He's a nice and well-liked person, but he's no seaman. And the text says, uh, Hervey's kindness and ignorance had played old Harry with the surprise, meaning played the devil. Even so, if Hervey had been the shining example of the finest officer in the service, he would nonetheless have been challenged by the fact that half the frigate's crew had been turned over and replaced from the Port Admiral's draft when they were last alongside. And here's the thing to remember. Many of the replacements came from the entire crew of a ship called the Raccoon that had been turned over straight away when they came into harbour uh, following a four years commission to North America. And they'd been put straight into the surprise without being allowed to go ashore. Ooh. And they, among other things, this has a social cost. So the Raccoons and the Surprises and a, the small number of landsmen aboard had not mixed together. So there are some jealousies. There are some people who are upset because they've got what they see as the wrong rating. But this jealousy isn't what's bothering Jack. He knows that fundamentally he's got a sound ship. He's got kind of good material resources, some good officers. What's haunting him is the thought of what's going on. And he's pretty sure that it's scurvy. But how could that be early in the voyage when they've got enough stores aboard for midshipmen to eat 28 rashes of bacon or whatever it was? He visits the galley. He visits the sick berth and he talks to Stephen and asks him to take the assistant surgeon, Mr. McAllister, and walk through the divisions looking for signs of scurvy. Jack goes under the berth deck now. He's still continuing his inspection. And and I think we've had so much going on here that O'Brien decides to give us a little humorous relief. As Jack's walking across the berth deck, there's an ill-looking cat, you know, and O'Brien gives this great long description of him with his crossed arms and everything else. And this cat is studying Captain Aubrey and the first lieutenant with insolence, it says. And the cat has a particular friend, an equally mangy green parrot who is laying on its side prostrated by the heat, saying, Aaron Gabra, Aaron Gabra, Ireland forever. And I'm, <laughs> I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm picturing this cat and I'm picturing this parrot here. And I'm thinking, oh, oh, this is this is kind of a nice shout out on the part of the parrot. You know, of course, Stephen, Ireland forever. Yes. But also forever, this echoing back of Sophie's last words, the last line oh, of the last man. chapter, forever and ever and ever. I'm going, oh, my gosh, you know, Brian, how do you do this here? But, you know, we go right past that. Jack and Harvey are agreeing that everything's fine on the birth deck and it's fine in the midshipman's berth and it's fine in the gun room, but it's not fine when they get to the sail room 
Jack finds mold on the first staysail he turns over, and it gets worse as other sails are brought out. Harvey is wringing his hands, and, and the bosun, usually made of much sterner stuff, this bosun who was there when Jack was a midshipman, is quickly reduced to the same condition as the first yeah. lieutenant by what you know Brian calls Jack's unfeigned anger and his utter contempt for the excuses offered. And this makes what O'Brien calls a shattering impression on Rattree, the bosun. So here was Jack thinking, oh, this is the bosun. He was, you know, he's been here for forever. I'm just this relatively young post-captain. Oh, wait a minute. I do know what I'm doing here. And the bosun's getting a little slack. You know, know, Jack's thought, I got a good ship, but she is elderly. She's been around for a while. I've got a bosun. He's been around for a while. I, you know, so we're getting this real kind of mixture of the state of the ship, the state of the people, lots of things going on here. So even though Jack had had this conversation and had all this immense anger and contempt, his conversation below with these two gentlemen had been in an absolute conversational tone of voice, not shouting at that, but nevertheless, this small ship the conversation had been heard above so that when they get back on deck, they're looking around and O'Brien tells us that there's an air of mixed delight and apprehension across the crew. Delight, well, at least in the ones who wouldn't spend the rest of their day Sunday rousing out all the sails because, you know, of this mold problem. So instead of their day off, they're going to be working, but a delight by the rest of them because the bosun had copped it. Yeah. But... <laughs> Even these folks who are delighting are still apprehensive too, lest, the text says, their own sins be discovered and that they cop it next from what they call this bleeding tartar, this right hard horse. So, you know, I'm, I'm just amazed how O'Brien has said it. Even we're, we're learning new characters. We're learning back history even more and more in this chapter about Stephen, about Jack. And here, you know, what a different view of Jack here than Jack on the lively. And yeah. Jack kind of adapting to the situation. Or is the situation adapting, Jack? I don't know. Let's take a pause in all this discussion of heat. I think I'm ready for something cool And uh, we'll be right back in a moment. Excellent plan. Jack orders church to be rigged. We've had the muster. We've had inspection. It's Sunday. So we have divine service. Everyone is waiting for this. And even Mr. Stanhope and his retinue have come up on deck. Mr. Stanley, the envoy, had been ill when he'd first come aboard, suffered from seasickness all the way down through Gibraltar, through the Canaries, and again in the swells of the doldrums. All of this had kept him to his cabin. And this seems like it's a, a first moment for him to get on deck and enjoy the open air. He enjoys singing. He, he knows and likes the Psalms. But his attention wanders as the parson announces the text of his sermon. And... We, it's funny, we spend a little moment in the point of view of Mr. Stanhope here. He's imagining the cool of his parish church back home, the tranquility of the family tombs, and he closed his eyes. And my, another little passing reference to death. Cool tombs, closed eyes. <laughs> well, Just and, and it's interesting because, you know, when he first comes on deck, O'Brien describes him as grey like a ghost. Right. And I'm thinking, oh my gosh, you know, here we go. Here we go. I don't know. We'll see. Wow. Is this O'Brien just ratcheting up in, in subtle ways our attention or is this some, you know, some, some plant for us? Don't know. So we've been talking a lot about hierarchy and the surprise as a small frigate is relatively lucky to have a parson aboard. So the Reverend Mr. White, for it is he, turns to reading his text, which is Psalm 75 verse 6, uh, promotion cometh neither from the east nor from the west nor from the south and all of the sailors and especially the midshipmen sitting and uh, sitting up and leaning in ready to hear more about this because this is this is their kind of stuff and jack thinks well this sounds like a flaming good text and he's probably congratulating himself for having a, a parson which is a sentiment that doesn't normally occupy much time with jack Aubrey. 
But then they were expecting for the parson to complete the fourth point of the compass and say, promotion cometh from the north, which I think they would have all regarded as an admirably useful everyday kind of an answer. But no, it turns out that he's going to say that promotion cometh from a code of conduct that he's going to describe under 10 main headings. And at that point, the eyes roll back in their heads and they're ready for the drone of the sermon. Everybody aboard abandons their attention for the past and they start thinking about their Sunday dinner. And for all hands, that means plum duff. Now, plum duff, if you've come across the book, the recipe book, Lobscouse and Spotted Dog, there are recipes for plum duff in there. Plum duff is a suet-based dried fruit pudding and it's delicious. If, if you take it to its ultimate in richness and gooiness, then you get a typical British uh, Christmas pudding. But I don't think that's quite what we would have had uh, aboard ship. Even so, plum duff, any kind of dessert, any kind of stodgy, suety dessert, even in this weather, is something for the whole crew to look forward to. That's going to get broken in on, though, because we hear a voice from the lookout. Sail ho! And now even the parson breaks off. The, the the moment has been ruined, it seems. And Jack gives orders to the man at the wheel to mind his course, begs the parson's pardon and says, continue. And now the, the crew are looking backwards and forwards because they don't know where to place their attention. They're bored of the parson. They were dreaming about Plum Duff. But Jack's telling them that we're not going to pay any attention to this strange sail. But Jack sits there unmovable, listening to the chaplain, who very, very quickly speeds up his pace and gets quickly, finally, to the 10th heading so a little bit of light comedy here but also new drama perhaps building on deck what's going on down below yeah down below we know Stephen never attends these services he's you know he's perhaps in the catholic service for some time but this time he's downstairs weeding blaine's diseases of semen and he hears the lookout's cry and turns to the cat who's now joined Stephen. And says, wait a minute, cat, how come there's no sound of turmoil overhead? I heard, you know, the announcement of a strange sale. Why is everybody not running to somewhere? What's going on? And and I, I thought, hold on, Blaine diseases of semen. We have Sir Joseph Blaine spelled differently. I wonder, is this real? And of course it is. Sir Gilbert nice. Blaine, you know, distinguished Scottish doctor, uh, became the the Physician to Admiral Lord Rodney, who was a martyr to gout, we, we read, uh, went from personal physician to physician of the fleet um, and actually made remarkable improvements in the health of seamen under the Admiral's command. He did publish this book, Observations on the Diseases of Seamen, in 1785. It was very influential, had lots of expanded editions. And he actually then goes on to the Sick and Hurt Board pushes through an amazing set of reforms, including the long overdue issuing of lemon lime juice as an anti-scorbutic to all ships, one that mm. plays in our story here, and was actually the first doctor ever knighted. He was uh, you know, knighted as a physician for all his contribution to the Navy. Interestingly, his philosophy was advocating good health as vital to military considerations, you know, when, you know, hmm. people would go, you know, bah, bah, don't worry about all that stuff. And, and, you know, part of his convincing everybody was asserting that if his reforms had not been put in place, Britain would have run out of semen long before Bonaparte could have been finally defeated. So I think there, you know, here's, here's a way to think about what's really a value to your audience. <laughs> yeah. Don't say these are all the right things to do. Think, hey, you'll never win the war unless you can keep these people healthy. I love right. that. Nothing wrong with a bit of utilitarianism now and again. Right. right. So the church service continues almost to noon, almost to the dinner hour. There's, we still have to do the noon observation. And even though nobody seems to care very much about the sun, there's a bit of a hurry now to get this noon observation done before dinner is served. Stephen asks Jack, as all this fumbling is going on, what's going on with this strange sail? Oh, says Jack, that's just St. Paul's Rocks. They're not going anywhere, and you may have a chance to see birds there this evening. And there's another long chain of command description of the order to make it 12, to make it local noon, going round between the officers and the, uh, the, the guy who rings the bell for the change of watch and all this stuff. And they pipe to dinner with the piping then drowned out by the tramp of feet and messes banging on their plate. And of course, Plum Duff, we're hoping for, is, is on, the, uh, on the menu. Stephen confirms to Jack that his suspicions were correct. 
this disease affecting the crew is scurvy. All of his texts, all of his authorities agree. His assistant Malister has seen many cases of it. And we find out that the recent history of the crew has an important part to play. The affected men were mostly those that came from the raccoon who had been months at sea before boarding the surprise. Jack says, well, this is great because, Doctor, you'll be able to set them up directly. No, 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 says Stephen. I wish I had more confidence in our lime juice. It's He uses the word sophisticated, which I think means contaminated. Ah. How, how about anything growing on the rocks, he asks. Jack says, no water, not a blade of anything green. So over to you, Doctor, to work some kind of miracle. And, and I love it because Jack tells Stephen, you know, how comforting it is to have him aboard. He says, it's like sailing with a piece of the true cross. Well, Ooh. Stephen's having none of that. No, number one, this is this is kind of a little blasphemous. I think Stephen's thinking, but he's also like, OK, he's always trying to dissuade Jack of these notions of, you know, how he can miraculously heal people. He says, stuff, stuff. He's very peevish. Peevish meaning, you know, irritated, especially by unimportant things like Jack, you know, you got to get off of this here. And and Stephen goes on to give one of his many kind of explanations to Jack about the limitations of medicine. We see this throughout the canon and he cites all these historical physicians in there and current physicians. And he says, you know, all of these people, as great as they all are, can do nothing, for example, about cancer. And, you know, he's like, Okay, but he sees the look on Jack's face and realizes, you know, I haven't made a dent in his faith here. So um, I I, I love this. Uh, Jack and Stephen walk out of this conversation to join the gun room for dinner. And Stephen's looking around. It's, you know, it's just boiling hot. And he's watching all these wines and the next set of wines and then the port all going around. And he's thinking, you know, this alcohol is blood hot. This is not going to help them. There's no way the human frame can withstand this. But he also observes that the human frame seemed to be withstanding it just fine. (laughs) It's great. Like always, a dinner is an important social occasion here. And it gives us, and I guess through Stephen's eyes especially, the chance to see some of the character of the officers. We've talked about Hervey, the first lieutenant, who is, it turns out, a victim in some way of the naval connections of his family. He's got all these relatives who are admirals. It's expected that by the time they get onto the East India Station, his uncle, the admiral there, will make him uh, into a commander and then he'll be made an anxious, ineffectual, diffident post-captain, which is quite, quite something to be doomed to, I guess. And clearly that's kind of, there's a significant part of the Navy that just works that way. We turn from Hervey then to the purser, the purser who's the brother of a captain who loved the idea of naval life but had a club foot. So he bought his way into being a purser and he was unusually uh, an honest purser as well. There's the master at the table too. That's Harrowby, who actually isn't a particularly great navigator, but had been promoted by an evangelical admiral who admired Harrowby's work on shore as a lay preacher. And we get this little discussion of how Harabi is kind of an, an, another person who's in that place sort of by chance. But he brings his own particular set of skills. But despite being a person with a club foot, he really enjoys the cutting out expeditions. And he's quite the, the warlike kind of a guy. And then finally, we get Nichols. Nichols, who had had this sort of odd look and this kind of dirty aspect when Jack had been inspecting his division earlier on at Muster. Nichols is the only one looking comparatively pale in this group. He's making an effort to be friendly, but his face seems to be set in this unhappy way. Stephen remembers in an earlier time that he'd seen Nichols being carried away back to his ship, singing like a canary, and thinks, well, what's going on here? How do all these parts of this character add up? Stephen looks at him and thinks this man is a typical sea officer. He has the kind of good breeding and the necessary leavening of roughness that allow officers to command other men. And then he goes on to this sort of musing that there's such a thing as a typical sea officer, but there are actually very few truly typical sea officers, only just a dozen out of all the ones that he's met. And he mentions a few famous ones. Uh, He mentions Dundas and Ryu and Seymour, Jack Aubrey, and perhaps Cochrane. And we'll just dig into a couple of those characters in a minute. But no, 
Maturin thinks to himself. Um, and by the way, this is a classical moment of Stephen Maturin saying what's on Patrick O'Brien's mind as the writer here. Stephen has this evaluation of Thomas Cochrane. Cochrane, is sure, was much too flamboyant to be typical, too full of himself, too conscious of his own value, too much affected by that Scotch love of a grievance. And there was that unfortunate title hanging about his neck, a beloved millstone. There was something of Cochrane in Jack, a restless impatience of authority, a strong persuasion of being in the right, but not enough to disqualify him, not nearly enough. And in any case, it had been diminishing fast these last years. I'm like, it's always nice when O'Brien talks about Cochrane because he's otherwise the kind of silent inspiration for so much of the stories here. And it's almost like O'Brien's sort of talking directly to us and breaking the fourth wall. Yeah, I, I, I agree. It's, you know, I feel like, you know, I'm watching, you know, one of those episodes where the character turns around and tells you something. And here it is. It's like, you know, for those of you who don't know I'm using Cochrane, I'm using Cochrane. But here's <laughs> how I'm using him differently. So it's great. But these other guys, too, Ryu, one of the best known sea officers and frigate captains, went from like lieutenant in 1789 where, as a lieutenant, he was commanding a transport ship headed to an Australian penal colony from England, and his ship, the HMS Guardian, uh, approached an iceberg to take on some water, but was badly holed. And he sent pretty much all of his crew off in boats, and he remained on the ship with 60 men. 22 of them were some of his convicts, for whom he later obtained pardons. And they nursed that ship 1,200 miles to Cape Town to rescue her, which, by the way, you might hear a similar story later in the canon, or you might be reminded of one. Yes, it was an inspiration <laughs> for Jack as well. And, and you see a book with a lot of that story, and it's slightly different. Now, this guy, interestingly, and, and I guess part of his remembered and Stephen's thing, he, he was there at the Battle of Copenhagen. And Nelson put him in charge of all the frigates and the small boats. And just as Nelson kind of put his blind eye up to the telescope to ignore the signal to withdraw and stayed in, cannon shot from the shore battery cut Ryu in half. So, wow, you know, what what a way to go. But this Ryu, uh, he mentioned, Stephen mentioned Michael Seymour. Seymour has been in the books before Post Captain. He's the guy that got pulling to the position in the Indiaman. But the real Sir Michael's adventures also inspired O'Brien. So we're getting this kind of a nice thing where O'Brien's saying, yeah, it's Cochrane. I'm also using Ryu. I'm using Michael Seymour. He was a member of the Irish gentry that entered the Royal Navy as a boy. Um, he lost an arm along the way. I won't go into a lot of this because there's a whole history between him and Jack in the canon, uh, yeah. which kind of coincides with a lot of the historical events there with him, including how he goes up, he becomes rear admiral, he becomes commissioner of the Portsmouth Dockyard, and then gets called back into active duty as commander of the South American station and actually dies there of of yellow fever in 1834. So these fascinating people and O'Brien not just breaking the uh, fourth wall on Cochrane, but also on some other folks as well. And these are stories that he hasn't even written about many of them and will. So he's kind of saying, here's what's ahead for you, ladies and gentlemen. Ah. Really fascinating. Thank you, Mike. Really good job. Um, Stephen comes and adds a note of confusion to the to the dinner. He says the captain's leaving the dinner, and Stephen says, "Well, so he is." And he he describes Jack's situation in the following way. He says he has catted his fish. Right. And no, nobody seems to know what this means. I think, I think Stephen is confusing two anchoring terms. Catting the anchor is one job where you hoist up the uh, the the ring of the anchor. Fishing is the next job where you hold up the crown so that we between these two um, acts of kind of heaving in and hooking on, the anchor is suspended sort of on its side across the bow of the ship. Catting and fishing. He means he has catted and fished his anchor, not that he has catted his fish. And somewhere on the internet, I'm sure there's a list of Stephen's naval malapropism somewhere. This should be pretty high on the list, I think. Now, back with the ship's company, and how is the rest of this easy, relaxing, sunny Sunday working out? Well, there are men swimming over the side in a sail. Stephen is looking through his glass at the birds on St. Paul's rocks, 
and wishes that he were there. And fans of these books and fans of the film all know that this is something that's an important important driver for Stephen Maturin. He says, Jack, uh, that is to say, Captain Aubrey, may I have a boat? And Jack says politely, well, you wouldn't have asked me that, Doctor, if you had remembered that it was a Sunday, meaning everybody's on a day off and you're in no place really to ask for favours just at the moment. But Lieutenant Nichols says, I'll pull you across. And even though Stephen can see that Nichols is rather in his cups, he thanks him and grabs his supplies and uh, and off they go. Stephen strips on the way over. And, you know, I've been... This view again, here's Stephen and Nichols in the boat. Stephen takes off all his clothes and he tells Nichols that he's been contemplating sea officers and what makes a good one. And he, you know, he just goes on kind of this monologue about that. You know, he says, I've seen many good or amiable midshipmen, fewer good lieutenants, still fewer captains and almost no good admirals. He lists possible explanations for those all reasonable. But then he adds, the text says, there must be the far fewer quality. In other words, you know, what do these admirals have? What do these officers have? The quality of resisting the effects, the dehumanizing effects of the exercise of authority. Authority is a solvent of humanity. Look at any husband, any father of a family, and note the absorption of the person by the persona, the individual by the role. Ah, wait, you quit being this person and you're now a father. Then you multiply the family and the authority by some hundreds and see the effect upon a sea captain to say nothing of an absolute monarch. Stephen says, surely man in general is born to be oppressed or solitary if he is to be fully human. Unless it so happens that he is immune to the poison. Ah, in the nature of the service, this immunity cannot be detected until late, but it certainly exists. So Stephen is trying to say that this exercising authority, you know, like takes away your humanity unless you're immune to it. And and then explains that, you know, the few fully human admirals he's either met or heard of, Duncan, Nelson, and he's about to go on and he sees that Nichols is you know, somewhere else in his mind. He's not <laughs> following. So Stephen stops talking. Right. And it's something, we're going to find out what it is that's on his mind, something a bit more serious than Plum Duff. Um, by the way, I mean, we all know Nelson, I guess, Britain's greatest naval hero, revered as a human leader, as, a, as an inspiring leader, as well as also a bit of a pain in the ass, by the way, but still revered yeah. by his sailors for his humanity and for his inspirational qualities. Admiral Duncan... Um, had been the the victor at the Battle of Camperdown in 1797. So an admiral from a decade or so earlier, really, than Nelson, had a very active fighting career, very much well known for taking care of seamen's welfare, um, believed that you know bad lower deck conditions could dre- lead men to desperate measures. And uh, interestingly, uh, similarly to Captain Augustus Keppel, Admiral Duncan often had public houses named after him. Public houses uh, bought and owned by uh, regular lower deck seamen who had uh, taken their money ashore with them and retired. So there are plenty of pubs named after Admiral Duncan. And I, I didn't realize that. I'd heard of pubs called the Keppel's Head, but I hadn't noticed that there are pubs called the Admiral Duncan. And it must be so. I loved in that history, Ian, that that this famous Battle of Camperdown that he won, that actually not very long before it, in you know, like a month or so before it, there'd been a mutiny aboard the ship and around the group that he was in. And he had actually quelled it with very humane means. So part of this, right. you know, like you say, this history of not just absolute authority, get the Marines, get the cannons, blow these people up. So very nice. Yeah. Stephen, because he sees that Nichols hasn't been listening, he pulls out a little book of Urdu phrases. You know, he wants to be able to speak some of the language of what he gets to their ultimate destination. But while he's reading these phrases to himself out loud, you know, kind of saying the words to practice this, he's also watching Nichols' face. And Nichols, he thinks, has been in a bad way since Gibraltar. And Stephen knows it's not scurvy, but he wonders, you know, could it be syphilis? Could it be worms? And then Nicholas kind of comes to, you know, he's just been sailing robotically. He apologizes for drifting off. And he asks Stephen, you know, what are you reading? And Stephen says, well, it's a phrase book. You know, I'm trying to learn the language. But it must have been compiled by a very 
disappointed man. And then he starts reading off all these examples of phrases. You know, why why would you translate this into Urdu, you know, and say, here's what you need to know for coming to visit. The phrases like, my horse has been eaten by a tiger or leopard or bear, you know, so you can say all these <laughs> stuff. All my money has been stolen. Another one, I've been beaten by evil men. And so he goes on and on and on in these examples, great and small, of these awful things here. Well, as you know, as Stevens reading those off, Nichols is saying, "Well, there's no landing on this side, so you know we're, we're going to pull around to the southern side." And as they get around there, this air is thick with turns and boobies overhead. But interestingly, all the birds are strangely mute. Hmm. Nichols, as Stephen is, you know, staring, you know, wonderingly at these birds. Nichols runs the boat up ashore. Stephen gets out and approaches the boobies who are sitting all around him and realizes they're not reacting to him at all. And he looks at this waterless, grassless, blazing rock with its unmoving air and says, this is a paradise. And Nichols says, well, you know, I'm glad you like it, but don't you think it's rather strong for a paradise and hellfire hot? And Stephen says, well, there is an odor, but the paradise I'm referring to is the tameness of the fowl. He's not saying this looks like some heavenly landscape. He's saying, you know, look at this. This is the tameness of the birds before the fall, is Stephen's quote. So this is nature untouched by sin. This is this interesting, you know, it's hot, it's awful. There's no food. There's no water. Your feet are burning just to touch this. Ah, this is a paradise, says Stephen. Wow. Wow. Nature untouched by sin gets juxtaposed now uh, with humanity touched by a kind of sin. Because we know this is probably about the same distance through the book as Stephen was in Master and Commander when he sat down to talk with James Dillon. And right. it turns out that uh, Nichols has got things on his mind. First of all, he's left Nichols under this shelter of clothes spread on oars, and he's finding these undescribed new-to-mankind species. He chooses a few that are not breeding and wrestles with his conscience a bit about whether he can take samples and, and dispatch them, knock them on the head, before he takes them back to the ship. And at one moment, Nichols makes this very abrupt statement about being ashore for some time after being paid off from his last ship until he'd been appointed to the surprise and how at that moment he, Nichols, had had a disagreement with his wife and this great confession comes tumbling out. And O'Brien says, Protestants often confessed to medical men and Stephen had heard this history before, always with the ritual plea for advice. The bitterly wounded wife, the wretched husband trying to atone, the civil imitation of a married life, the guarded words, politeness, restraint, resentment, the blank misery of nights and waking, the progressive decay of all friendship and communication. But he had never heard it expressed with such piercing, desolate unhappiness. Wow. Wow. And we we never quite find out. I, I when I first read this, I thought Nichols was confessing to adultery. I think he's actually saying he's he's impotent. He can't, you know, he can't fulfill his marriage. But I don't know. What, what do you think, Mike? What do you think he's confessing to? I, you know, I, I, what what I thought was, I wish I knew. <laughs> right. It's like, wait a minute, this is confession, and it's, but we never. I don't think we ever get exactly what it was. Certainly, we see other examples later in the canon where it's absolutely impotence, or it's, you know. I've got to have it and she doesn't want it. And, right. and what do I, you know, so it's usually around these kinds of things. But I guess more importantly, one of the things that seems to be going through this chapter is, is not just what happened, but how do you react to it? What's yeah. your response to it? And I think we see it in so many different ways. And that, that seems to be where it turns here a little bit. Yeah. Because what Nichols knows for sure is how his wife has reacted and how he, believes that she will continue to react. He says he thought that it might be better when he was afloat, but now he's getting no letters at any of their stops, despite there having been English ships with post having arrived ahead of him. He said he had walked and walked, composing the reply to the letters that he believed would be waiting for him at the next stop. But there were no letters and there will be no letters. He couldn't believe it before, he says, but now he does. 
I tell you, Maturin, I cannot bear it. Not this long, slow death. Look a little mention of death for you death collectors in yes. this chat. Yes, yeah. right. Stephen says, it's, it's sort of trying to temporize a little bit and say, well, perhaps it's not so bad. I've received very few letters at Madeira. Maybe there'll be more at Rio. Oh, you can count on that. Or maybe even Bombay. No, said Nichols, with a toneless certainty. There will be no letters anymore. I have bored you too long with my affairs. Forgive me. If I were to rig a shelter with the oars and my shirt, would you like to sit down under it? Surely this heat will give you a sunstroke. And Stephen replies, no, thank you. Time is all too short. I must quickly explore this stationary arc. The deer knows when I shall see it again. I might. Part of this makes me think, if, if James Dillon ha had not cornered Stephen below decks with a bottle of whiskey, but he in fact tried to corner Stephen, you know, above a cliff with some birds, he would never have had the conversation had the Stephen Maturin that he had. <laughs> so Stephen's very politely I, yep. blowing poor Nichols off here for a bunch of boobies. He absolutely is. He absolutely is. And, and I think Stephen realizes this and tries to rationalize it to himself a little bit. You know, the text says, Stephen hoped Nichols would not resent it later. Regular confession was far more formal, far less detailed and spreading, far less satisfactory in its unsacramental aspect. But at least a confessor was a priest his whole life through, whereas a doctor was an ordinary human being much of the time, difficult to face over the dinner table after such Privities. So I'm thinking, you know, this this will all be good because, you know, Nichols, if he tells me all about this in detail, he's going to feel really funny sitting across the gun room for right. me. And, and you know, having having kind of passed this out of my mind, like, you know, I, I know I just blew him off, but I really got to get back up there because he had come back to grab a hammer because he had seen this unusual arachnid that had kind of, you know, scurried down into a crack and he's trying to get into that crack. So he's hammering away at this crack, trying to get to this arachnid. And he sees drops falling on the rocks kind of there. And he's surprised, you know, he said, it's a wonder I have any sweat left. He's like, you know, and then he's like, no, no, wait, there are these huge drops on his back. And he realized, oh, no, this is warm rain. It's unlike the dung that countless birds had gratified him with. I thought this was a great O'Brien, you know, uh, turn of phrase, the dung that countless birds had gratified him with. Like, Stephen, oh, yeah, I love getting shit on by the birds here. <laughs> but the round, you know, Stephen does now, and the western sky he sees is complete darkness with a white line on the sea approaching with inconceivable rapidity, and there are no birds in the air. The darkness he sees is lit from within by red lightning. Thinking, all right, Ian, you kept talking about colors, red, wait, matter penetrating the bones of rats red lightning deep within the storm here red red you know here we go yeah here's a here's a color theme in case you hadn't already noticed it right well, right it's this this absolutely cataclysmic storm the sun is covered up by the clouds there are jets of warm water as warm as the air hurtling down upon stephen the jets are so thick that stephen can hardly breathe he lets the water gush through his hands and drinks pint after pint of this fresh water. The deluge covers his ankles and the boxers start to float away, even though he tries to sort of grab a couple of them. He manages to squat over them. The rain is roaring down. There's thunder. The squall is right overhead. And at that point, the wind knocks Stephen down and the cataclysm increases even more, tenfold. There are successive lightning strikes hitting the rocks amid the darkness. He wonders now about the ship, about the surprise. Can the birds survive? And is Nichols safe? And with with a brief kind of tumultuous paragraph or so of uh, description, all of a sudden, the storm is over. The westward world, the, looking to windward, if you like, where the weather's coming from, is unchanged except for the white caps. But to the east, the squall covers the place where the ship had been. In the current below, Stephen sees a stream of fledgling birds floating along. There are large and small sharks coming up to feast on the bodies and he runs down the slope calling for nickels he sees dead birds in a row burned and despite the damp they're smelling of fire he reached the spot where the shelter had been no shelter no fallen oars and where they had hauled up the boat there was no boat 
he made his way clean round the rock, leaning on the wind and calling in the emptiness. And when for the second time he came to the eastern side and looked out to sea, the squall had vanished. There was no ship to be seen. Climbing to the top, he caught sight of her, hulled down and scudding before the wind under her foretopsail, her mizzen and main topmast gone. He watched until the flicker of white disappeared. The sun had dipped below the horizon when he turned and walked down. The boobies had already set to their fishing again, and the higher birds were still in the sun, flashing pink as they dived through the fiery light. End of chapter five. Wow. Wow. You know, I, I, I feel like I got to go back and count how many times at the end of an Aubrey Matron chapter, I say, wow. <laughs> and, and, you know, this is clearly another one. We started with the fiery dots. We ended with the fiery light. And, you know, it's this fascinating chapter that, that also has me scratching my head asking, you know, what's going on here? It seems at first glance, like a bit of one of those kind of setup chapters that moves the pieces around the board, introduces some new characters, starts to dig more into other characters, but doesn't seem to move the plot along very far, just kind of transitioning and setting it up. Um, doesn't seem to touch as much of the arc of the story that we've been following but clearly, as we're seeing here, there's so much more going on here. And, and, you know, I keep kind of coming back to dig in more and try to make sense of it. Right. As you say, Mike, for, for a chapter with not much going on, there's a lot going on. We, we're having that all, all of this is taking place without the presence of Sophie or Diana. Uh, we haven't really had much of the envoy, uh, maybe a little bit, uh, him and his secretary. We're mostly in the ocean with the ship's crew and learning about the structure and hierarchy of the crew. And we're learning a bit about the surprise herself as a ship. We're learning about how people are standing close to one another. Some of the crew standing further away. People already know what to expect and what to do when they're called into action by the chain of command. And all of this is sort of in contrast to Stephen's reflection about authority sucking the humanity out of the people who exercise it. Because what's happening in the ship's company thanks to Jack's leadership, is that actually authority is injecting some structure and some kind of humanity and purpose into these people, which is really fascinating. I agree. It, it's, it's kind of this back and forth there. And, and we just closed on this thing with Nichols, and I'm wondering, you know, what's that all about? He's one of those somewhat rare characters who we meet, dig into, and lose in the same chapter. Yeah. And, and it's a little spooky that, you know, this is a character that Stephen had just been describing as a typical sea officer. It's a little spooky that marriage seems to be the thing that's completely undone him. We don't know exactly why. And we're, we're hearing about all this as Jack is supposedly about to get married, perhaps, maybe, as Pullings just recently told Jack that it's, you know, marriage, it's not what you think. It's not like being afloat. Mm. And and remember that Stephen had wished so dearly that he'd married Diana. Is this the fate that her leaving saved Stephen from? <laughs> you know, oh well, gosh. at least Stephen, you know, you might be the lucky one in this situation. Who knows? Who knows? It's, you know, how do we feel about all this stuff here? Yeah. By, by the way, just to make a connection back, uh, Nichols being a character who was fated to dis disappear the moment we got to know him, if this was Star Trek, he'd have been wearing a red shirt. <laughs> he'd oh, well put, <laughs> well put. Yeah, there you go, Steve. You could probably give us 20, 20 examples of that. <laughs> now, there are a couple of other interesting themes for this, again, incredibly rich chapter. As we've said, Mike, things are changing quickly and we're seeing how people respond. We've got the uh, arrival of scurvy aboard the boat in the in the person of the raccoons, especially. We've got the storm on the rocks. We've got the disappearance of Nichols. And we've got this theme of relentless change and relentless kind of fate as well. Hervey's destiny is kind of fixed by his family and his connection, even though he's diffident and ineffectual. Um, scurvy came at the ship from a long way in advance. It was almost inevitable. And O'Brien is even resorting to turning to the fourth wall to say to us, look how the story's turning out here. Look what's going on. Um, he moves as a writer between setting things up for us far in advance and letting us anticipate them and sometimes giving us a reward for that and sometimes just changing, you know, turning on a sixpence. And Mike, I guess this is just like life. 
I, I want to do one more theme as well that's really caught my eye. And I loved how you highlighted this at the end of the chapter here. Um, light and fire. And I think the color red are a theme all the way through this chapter. We know, as we said at the beginning, O'Brien loves to use light imagery and language when he's being poetic. He's talking, has been talking for a while, and is going to continue to talk about fire and heat and warmth having the power somehow to cure Stephen's injuries. And we started the chapter with sun and a fiery dart of sun in the sky. We finished it with birds flashing pink through the fiery light. We've got fiery lightning, copper on the hull, copper in the galley, madder being fed to rats, red marines tunics, sunburn scalps, scarlet faces, gold earrings. If, if that's not enough for you, I don't know what is. But red is a thing. Let's keep an eye out for it. Only one non-red thing was the green parrot lining kind of drunkenly over the side saying, island forever. and scurvy's taking its toll because we've got no green stuff the lime juice is contaminated you know there ain't no green here there's only reds and oranges and purples you're so right it, it, actually you're telling Stephen, you know, not a bit of green not a blade of it we kept hearing that more and more on the rock here you know i was fascinated as, as you're saying Ian, but now we have Stephen alone on a desolate island what's going to happen we heard about the heroes swimming the hellespont and not making it Stephen vowing to do the same ian what do you say to just a little bit more Patrick O'Brien next week? With all my heart. in this infernal tub uh, no person sorry sorry said no peace in this inter the time's the charm <laughs> if, if we're you're exactly if we're looking for outtakes today i think we're gonna have plenty no peace in this infernal hub or tub persecution <laughs> judaic superstition sorry, ritual said infernal hub. <laughs> Did I really? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> All right. This is the gift that keeps giving. No peace in this. If <laughs> All right. This is when I should have taken acting classes.